and let her know uh, we, uh, we want to develop a team other than my wife that, uh, that, that we can count on on a regular basis. So thank you for that. Deaconesses are meeting right after the service this morning. Uh, just a reminder that on Wednesday nights, uh, we have prayer meeting here at 7. Ultimate Frisbee out on the recreation field at 6, for those of you who are uh, fit enough to enjoy that. Um, and, uh, and on Tuesday nights, we have our Bible study awake. Uh, and you can talk to the Stanleys or uh, the Smokes about that. So let's see. I think that's all of our announcements. The scripture says in Psalm 68, verse 5, A father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy dwelling. The one we have come to worship this morning, the one that we just sang to and will sing to some more this morning, th this, by the way, this is not his holy dwelling. You are his holy dwelling. And he is a father to the fatherless. He is a defender of the weak and a defender of the widow, a defender of the orphan. We come to worship this morning. We come to worship a good and compassionate God. We're going to hear some about how all-powerful he is this morning, but know that he is good and he is compassionate. Heavenly Father, we come into your presence this morning eager to meet with you. And what's mind-blowing to us, or should be, is that you are eager to meet with us. But you are. And we are so grateful, Lord, that you you care about those who are defenseless, that you care about those who, who stand in need of a rescuer. We are all there. And at some times, some of us more than others, and we just thank you so much for your great love for us. And we ask, Lord God, as we come together as your people and lift up your name in worship and in praise and in thanksgiving, Lord, that you would be pleased with the offering that we present you, an offering of praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand together and worship in song.
doesn't give me away, I'm just letting you know. <laughs> and it wasn't until I got down to Florida that I heard the saying, and if that doesn't touch your heart, your wood's wet. <laughs> your wood is wet. She's still trying to figure that out. <laughs> I hope your wood is not wet this morning. Let's continue our worship as we... In other words, you can't start a fire with wet wood. Yeah. Not on fire for the Lord. <laughs> Frank and I are both confused, okay? I'm wrong. <laughs> so we're going to continue our worship. I don't know if, if something's lost in the translation for you folks out there, but uh, trust us, it was a funny moment. <laughs> we are going to do as we have been doing the past several weeks. This will be a March offering, and we just invite you to come and place your offering in the place. Please come down the center aisle and turn to your seats along the side aisles. For those of you who uh, desire to, uh, to support the Ministry of Friendship Bible Church uh, as you're worshiping with us online, uh, you can do that and go to uh, Friendship Bible Church, Keystone Heights, uh, Florida, and you'll find a link there where you can donate. Uh, you can come by the office if you're local, and, uh, and you can take care of it there as well. But uh, however you choose to give, this is giving to the Lord and to his wonderful work. It's giving to him because he has given everything to us. Let's give thanks for this offering. Father, we, we love you so much. And our love for you is just an overspill of your love for us. It's natural that an 
in expressing love, we give. And, and so we want to do that. Uh, and we pray, Lord, that you would use what your people give for furthering your kingdom, uh, that it would have great impact not only here, but uh, to the farthest reaches of the earth. And we ask it in Jesus' name.
in your heart and mind as, as we pray together, but just to kind of keep before you even after we leave this place as you head home into whatever your busy day and week might look like. One is that uh, uh, we are engaged in planning a church in Gainesville, and uh, Pastor Randy is there. I think uh, Bob and Debbie Britton are with him this morning, and, uh, uh, and so we want to keep them in prayer. And I, I want to, uh, as part of the inspiration uh, and motivation for doing this, uh, I want you to think about this, that in spite of the uh, rise of mega churches in the past uh, few decades, there is not a single county in the entire United States of America that has more church attenders now than 10 years ago. Now there's good news in that. And the good news is that contrary to popular uh, conception and perception, uh, the mega church does not just suck the life out of the small church. The small church is doing the work of the kingdom. Not that the mega church isn't. But understand that even with the rise of mega churches, uh, this has this has not greatly impacted the United States uh, in terms of getting the gospel out there. It's not the size of the church that matters. It says in Acts chapter 14, They made many disciples and then appointed for them elders in every church. From the very beginning of the book of Acts, the very beginning of the, the church as we know it now, uh, it started because churches were planted. And consider the fact that the very first church in Jerusalem, if it hadn't planted and daughtered other churches, we wouldn't be here today. This is biblical, and this is what God is all about. So please pray for Randy and for uh, his church planting team as we go into prayer and keep that before you. Also, um, just want the, our, our body here uh, to be aware. Uh, Lynn's dad uh, is, is, is in his last days. Uh, he does not have long. We don't know how long. Uh, and you know you've prayed with us for uh, her folks for a a long time now, but this is clearly uh, nearing the end. And so please be in prayer for her family, for her, her parents, and, and for Lynn herself. She'll be making trips probably uh, more frequently than before, uh, so we just appreciate your prayer support there. Uh, let's see if, uh, oh yes, and Arthur Smith. Uh, he and Linda could not be here today and probably won't be here for a couple of weeks. A couple of family members uh, were, were exposed to people who had coronavirus, and, uh, and so uh, while no symptoms have shown up or anything like that, they're being uh, cautious and safe uh, as they should. And then Glenn Smoke injured himself on uh, the day of work, and, uh, and so he's off his feet, uh, resting his, uh, his swollen right foot. So please be in prayer for all of these folks. Let's go before the Lord, it's a, it's a good thing to be able to come as brothers and sisters in Christ and know that even as, as we come before you in worship and in praise, that, that we often come with a, a whole slew of needs and concerns and, and things that weigh on us. And, and you know all about that as we come in. But you invite us to, to lay that at your feet, and so we do. We willingly do, because we, we know that while we play the game sometimes of thinking that we've got everything under control, the reality is we don't. Only you, only you have everything under control. So we yield ourselves to you. We trust you, Lord, with, with every facet of our lives. And especially, Lord, when, when those times come where life seems wrenched out of control and, and we're thrown for a loop, all the more, Lord, we turn to you. We thank you that nothing takes you by surprise. And that as we have been reminding ourselves from your word, all things work together for good for those who love you and are called according to your purpose. So thank you, Lord. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you for hearing us. 
thank you for knowing before we even ask uh, what's on our hearts. Thank you, Lord, that you desire this conversation with people. And Lord, as, as I stand here before you, on behalf of the body, I know there are, there are people here who have things hidden deep inside that for whatever reason they keep to themselves but they are glad to have you poke around those those areas and so Lord God we, we invite you to come we, we hold nothing back from you not, not that we could but we, we just remove all barriers all pretense and we invite you Lord just to search us to know us inside and out, everything there is to know about us. And Lord, if there's anything there that is unpleasing, unacceptable to you, we just, we, we say, clean us out, Lord God. Just we, we repent of that, take it away, clean us out. That we might be pure and holy, clean vessels for you to use. Unhampered, unhindered. I pray, Lord, that you would meet us here in this place. You've already been doing that. We thank you for that. As we open your word, I pray, God, that you would speak to us through it. This is your word. It's not the opinion of man. And I pray, Lord, that you would protect me in the process from, from inserting anything of me. I just want to be your vessel. So, Lord, we open ourselves to you. In Jesus' name. Well, would you turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Esther once again? And uh, we are in Esther chapter 7. And uh, for those of you who, uh, just a reminder, I don't think I said this before, and, and hopefully most of you know this, but uh, for the sake of those who may be new, uh, if you're worshiping with us today and you have uh, a phone, an electronic device that connects to the internet via Wi-Fi, please do put it on um, airplane mode or turn it off, uh, which I neglected to do, so I'm going to do that right now. Uh, and um, that will help us a great deal, uh, and we appreciate your cooperation with that. It creates a live streaming atmosphere that's very positive, so thank you for that. So Esther chapter 7. Verse 1, so the king and Haman went to Queen Esther's banquet, and as they were drinking wine on the second day, the king again asked, Queen Esther, what is your petition? It will be given you. What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be granted. And then Queen Esther answered, If I have found favor with you, your majesty, and if it pleases you, Grant me my life. This is my petition. And spare my people. This is my request. For I and my people have been sold to be destroyed, killed, and annihilated. Now listen to this. She says, if we had merely been sold as male and female slaves, I would have kept quiet. Because no such distress would justify disturbing the king. King Xerxes asked Queen Esther, Who is he? Where is he, the man who has dared to do such a thing? Esther said, An adversary. An enemy. This vile Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and queen. The king got up in a rage, left his wine, and went out into the palace garden. But Haman, realizing that the king had already decided his fate, stayed behind to beg Queen Esther for his life. Just as the king returned from the palace garden to the banquet hall, Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was reclining, and the king exclaimed, Will he even molest the queen while she is with me in the house? 
As soon as the word left the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. And then Harbona, one of the eunuchs attending the king, said a pole reaching to a height of 50 cubits stands by Haman's house. He had set it up for Mordecai, who spoke up to help the king. And the king said, impale him on it. So they impaled Haman on the pole he had set up for Mordecai. And then the king's fury subsided. Before we take a closer look at Esther chapter 7, listen to this descriptive passage about Judgment Day in the book of Revelation. In Revelation 20, beginning with verse 11. This is the Apostle John on the island of Patmos, and he says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it, the earth, and the heavens fled from his presence. There was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were open. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. We don't hear very much about judgment day anymore in Christian circles. Perhaps preachers are afraid of turning people off, and maybe it will, although that never seemed to be a deciding factor for Jesus. The truth is, Judgment Day is a reality. It will come for the human race, as well as for Satan and the demonic realm. Judgment Day is coming, but here's the truth behind that truth. Judgment Day is a part of the gospel we are to proclaim. Judgment Day is actually good news. It's good news. How is Judgment Day good news? I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> first, Judgment Day shows God's grace. Take a look at the first four verses again with me. Esther chapter 7 clearly describes what Judgment Day for Haman looked like once his true nature was revealed by King Xerxes. But his day of earthly judgment also reflects a good deal about the nature of the Judgment Day to come and about the very nature of God himself. Specifically, it highlights God's grace. Verses 1 and 2 Take us to the second banquet Queen Esther put together to honor the king and to seek his mercy. So for the third time, the king says to his beloved queen, Queen Esther, what is your petition? What is it you want? I'll give it to you to have my kingdom. And this wasn't just a matter of the king being in a good mood because he's had a glass of wine or two. This has consistently been the king's attitude toward Esther, his queen, and his bride. Esther's banquet was a gift to her husband. It was a gift to her king. And the king was inclined to receive this demonstration of her love and her loyalty to him. He knew she had a favor to ask. And he knew she was intentionally packaging that request in a way that, would, that he would appreciate and, and that he would receive well. Esther was showing him love and honor and respect. Is this not what we do when we come together and worship? Do we not come as the bride of Christ to offer him love and honor and respect? 
And as we come, do we not come often burdened with troubles and worries that we desperately want the Lord to deal with as only he can? Listen, God loves it when you come to him in genuine love and genuine humility. Where what you, what you want more than anything else is to be with him. To be at peace with him. To know that, that God takes delight in you. It says this in Psalm 149, verse 4, For the Lord takes delight in his people. He crowns the humble with victory. God knows what you want before you ask him. He just wants you to want him more than the fulfillment of any request you might have. Take delight in the Lord, it says in Psalm 37, verse 4. Take delight in the Lord. It's not just coming to him like he's Santa Claus and, and you need stuff. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart, it says there in Psalm 37. God is inclined to give you the desires of your heart when you delight in Him. When you love spending time in His presence and when your desires are in line with His desires. He loves you. He loves you more than Xerxes could ever imagine loving his beautiful queen, Esther. God loves you so much. Take a look at verses 3 and 4. When, when the king asked Esther for the third time, what is your request there in verse 3? Esther makes it clear. She understands that if the king grants her request, it is purely an act of grace on his part. He owes her nothing, and she owes him everything. That's why she says, if I have found favor with you, your majesty. And she says, and if it pleases you. You know, the word translated favor here, uh, it means the same thing as grace. An undeserved gift. She uses the word favor in much the same way that we would request something as a favor of someone. Just by phrasing it that way. Can you do me a favor? We're stating that we understand that there's no obligation on their part to grant that request. But Esther takes it even a step further. A more little translation of the Hebrew here reads, if your eyes see me through grace, or you could put it this way, if, if you look at me through grace. In other words, she is counting on the king, seeing her in his presence, the same way she sees herself. It's totally undeserving of being there. She stands in his presence by his grace, and she makes her request dependent upon his grace. For you who are followers of Jesus Christ, this is your position before God at the day of judgment. You are already in his presence, and you are there by his grace. Do you believe that? Do you understand that? You are already in his presence, and you're there by his grace. And not only that, but like Esther, you are at the king's table as his friend and as his bride. You will not stand before God at judgment day awaiting judgment. You will stand with God in Christ Jesus as the bride of Christ participating in judgment on those who, like Haman, have rebelled against the king of the universe. The Apostle Paul put it this way in 1 Corinthians 6, 2 and 3. Or do you not know that the Lord's people will judge the world? And if you are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Do you not know we will judge angels, he says, how much more the things of this life? As a follower of Jesus Christ, 
We have been saved from God's judgment. When you talk about getting saved, well, that's a huge part of what you've been saved from, God's judgment. Jesus was judged by God in your place. And you've been saved by his grace. And you will stand with God on Judgment Day because of His grace as judgment falls on those who have rejected God's right to rule their lives in the universe. Judgment Day shows God's righteousness. Not only His grace, but it shows His righteousness. Having entrusted her life and her future entirely to the king's love and the, and the king's grace, Esther finally states her request in verses 3 and 4. What does she ask for? If it pleases you, grant me my life. That's my petition. And spare my people. That's my request. I've been sold. My people have been sold to be destroyed and killed and annihilated. I wouldn't even bother you, king, if, if we'd just been sold to be slaves. What a difference between Esther's position and attitude toward the king than, than that of Haman, who sought to manipulate the king for his own self-advancement in the kingdom, even if that meant killing those he viewed as in his way. The very nature of Esther's request lit a flame of righteous indignation and wrath in the king. Who would even dare to threaten the life of his beloved queen? I mean, the sheer magnitude of the evil perpetrated, it was just it was mind-blowing. Who would do this? And Esther says in verse 6, an adversary and enemy. This vile Haman. Now just to help you grasp how much courage that took. Remember who Haman was. The king trusted him above everybody else. And it says Haman was terrified before the king and the queen once she spewed that out. Whatever the king expected to hear from Esther, it certainly wasn't this. This was his most trusted advisor. And it so infuriated the king that he left the banquet hall in a rage, going out to the famous Hanging Gardens of Babylon, one of the seven ancient wonders of the world, to consider what action needed to be taken. I was even thinking, contemplating, as I was working on this and, and reading through the passage, that maybe he went out to cool down. I don't think so. He didn't want to cool down. He just wanted to know how to appropriately take all of that rage and put it where it belonged. Make no mistake, the day of judgment, foreshadowed here by the king's judgment about to descend on Haman, is a day of God's wrath. A day in which his righteous Fury is unleashed against everyone and everything that has participated in rebellion and sin against him since sin first entered the world. Listen to the language of the book of Revelation as the coming day of God's wrath is, about, is brought into view. Revelation 16, 1. John says, then I heard a loud voice from the temple, this is the temple in heaven, saying to the seven angels, go! Go! Pour out the seven bowls of God's wrath on the earth. Same chapter, verse 19. The great city split into three parts. And the cities of the nations <coughs> collapsed. The cities of the nations collapsed. God remembered Babylon the great and gave her the cup filled with the wine of the fury of his wrath. Revelation 19, verse 15, coming out of his mouth, this is, this is about Jesus, coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. At Christ's return, he strikes down the nations. And the scripture goes on to say, he will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. 
And in Revelation 14, verse 9, a third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, If anyone, anyone worships the beast and its image and receives its mark on their forehead or on their hand, they too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. They will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment will rise up forever and ever. There will be no rest day or night for those who worship the beast and its image or for anyone who receives the mark of its name. God can get angry. As in the book of Esther, God's day of final judgment is preceded by an unleashing of his wrath. My question is, how is any of that good news? How in the world are we supposed to share that with those who are not yet believers in the hope that they will respond to the gospel message in a positive way? Well, judgment day shows God's righteousness. It is the day when everything that's wrong in the world will be made right. Judgment Day is good news because it answers the biggest complaint, the biggest criticism non-believers have. If God is so all-powerful and all-good, why does he allow so much evil in the world to continue? Well, guess what? The day is coming. When that will cease. Enough! God will say. Done! And he will eradicate every last vestige, every last memory, every last shadow of sin and an evil and all that it has done in his creation. It will be gone forever. Judgment Day is good news. Because Jesus came to rescue everyone on the planet from God's wrath. He came to rescue every person on the planet from God's judgment so that only those who refuse God's grace experience God's wrath. I hope that puts John 3, 16 and 17 into perspective for God so loved the world. He gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. You, children of God, have been rescued from the day of God's wrath. Can you say hallelujah? <laughs> Judgment Day is good news. It's the gospel for those who believe. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, Paul says, For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Finally, I don't know about finally, but finally for this message, Judgment Day shows God's final authority over all things. Verses 8 and 10. Verse 8 reads in, in Esther 7, Just as the king returned from the palace garden to the banquet hall. I mean, what a scene this is. I mean, you know that in ancient times and Bible times, especially in that part of the world, when you sat down to eat, you didn't sit at a table with chairs. You reclined on cushions and, and, and kind of propped yourself up on, on the, your elbow and, and you ate with the other hand. Uh, that's, that's how they ate in those days. So, so when... You're seeing this banquet. Picture all these plush cushions all around a low table with tons of food all over and stuff like that. And the queen, when she has said to the king, this Haman is the one responsible, she's in that reclining position. It's not like she stood up and pointed a gnarly finger and got all, all bent out of shape about it. She is in her reclined position at table, a morsel of food on her way to her mouth, and she goes... An enemy did this. And it's Haman, this vile Haman. That's it. So she's still in that position when the king goes out to the garden. She's still in that position when the king comes back to the garden and from the garden. And just as the king returned from the palace garden to the banquet hall, Haman was falling on the couch where the queen was reclining. 
Not a good plan. Will he even molest the queen while she's with me in my house? I mean, outrage upon outrage. And as soon as the word left the king's mouth, they covered him in his face. That means they put something like a burlap bag or something like that over him, and they bound him, and they let him out. This is the power and the final authority of the king. As soon as the word left the king's mouth, they covered him in his face. There was no appeal, no lawyer, no Miranda rights, no trial by jury. The king's word is final. Now, when you declare, bringing it up to present day, when you declare that Jesus is Lord, you are saying that he is in control, that he's in charge, in charge of the universe, in charge of history, in charge of your life. Peter put it this way in the day of Pentecost in Acts 2.36. He says, therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Or as we would say, both Lord and Christ. In other words, when you declare Jesus is Lord, you are freely acknowledging that he is your king. His authority is beyond question. His power to enforce that authority is unstoppable. His word is final. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Amen. You ought to even be a little bit afraid to say amen to that. But you ought to say it. Jesus is Lord, amen? amen? Jesus often used the absolute power and the absolute authority wielded by a king as examples of what heaven is like. As we saw a couple of weeks ago, Jesus consistently described heaven as a kingdom. Not a democracy. Not a republic. Not a communist, socialist, or fascist structure of society. But a kingdom. Where the king's word is law. And if you wonder sometimes why Jesus was born 2,000 years ago, rather than in the modern, enlightened, technologically advanced age, at least one reason is that this so-called modern age has all but left behind the structure of kingdoms. And yet of all the forms of government devised by man, the one closest in design to the government of heaven is the kingdom. For in the kingdom of heaven, as in true earthly kingdoms, the king reigns supreme. In Jesus' parable of the kingdom of heaven in Matthew 22, beginning in verse 1, where Jesus likens heaven to a wedding banquet held for the king's son, there's a guest who shows up inappropriately dressed for the royal event. And in verses 11 and following, Jesus says, But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. And he asked, How did you get in here without wedding clothes, friend? The man was speechless. And then the king told the attendants, Tie him hand and foot, throw him outside into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are invited few are chosen. The king passed judgment on the undesirable guest. And that judgment was immediate, swift, and final. King Xerxes passed judgment on Haman, and his judgment was immediate, swift, and final. As we see in verses 9 and 10, Harbona, one of the eunuchs standing, uh, attending the king, said, a pole reaching a height of 50 cubits, that's 70 feet high, has already been set up by Haman's house, and he had it put there to stick Mordecai on it. And the king said, impale Haman on it. So they impaled Haman on the pole that he had set up for Mordecai. Then the king's fury subsided. In Matthew 25, verse 14, we see the same thing in Jesus' parable of the talents. 
That's the, the bags of gold uh, that were entrusted to servants by their master when he went away on a journey. This is a, a master-slave scenario where the master, like a king, has total authority over the slave. And upon the master's return, two of the three servants have invested the gold and they've made a profit and they were rewarded for it by their master. The third, you'll remember, was afraid to invest the gold. He buried it instead and he gave it back to the ma master when he returned, but with no profit. So that one received nothing for his trouble. He even lost what he had to begin with. And then he was tossed out on, a, on his ear uh, from the master's household. And in verse 34, Jesus compares those servants the master rewarded with you. His faithful followers who remained faithful to him until his return in glory. He said in Matthew 25, verse 34, then the king, the king, will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. The day of judgment is only to be feared by those who are on the wrong side of the kingdom. But here's the thing. Those who are on the wrong side of the king don't know it. Most of them don't know it. Like Haman, they make their way in the world as best they can, deceiving even themselves uh, into thinking that they are in control of their own fate. Esther almost didn't get the courage up to say anything to the king. But when she did... She also, get this, she also invited Haman to the banquet table. She invited Haman to the banquet table. Every time you share the good news with something, you're invited with someone, you're inviting them to the banquet table. You're giving them options. Haman knew the jig was up. But he chose to do nothing to save himself. And then when he realized that the moment when he could have done something was gone and it's too late, he fell at Esther's feet asking for forgiveness when he should have thrown himself at the mercy of the king as Esther had already done. So what's our takeaway from this? Well, it's twofold. One, judgment day, I hope you get it, is actually good news. It's good news. When people know judgment is coming, they have the opportunity and perhaps the incentive to repent and change sides. Two, you are God's Esther, positioned by God to rescue your family and your friends. Don't leave out judgment day when you share the gospel with them. How will they know? unless somebody tells them. Let's pray. Lord, these are sobering things. But they consistently, continually turn us to your grace and to your righteousness and to your sovereignty as king. You are a good God. You are so good you will not let evil stand forever. And we thank you for that. And I pray, Lord God, that as we leave this place, we might be further emboldened by your spirit and by your word to share the good news with those who need to hear it most and to use every possible example we have in life and in your word to share, them just how, share with them just how good you are, how gracious you are. You are king, and your word is final. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Take a breath. Get ready to praise the Lord. Let's stand together. Inhale. That's a lot to kind of take in. Give it out in praise and worship. Thank mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm.
Let us hold on unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. God's people said. Amen. Amen. Amen.